Welcome back my friends. Uh, today we have got the next in the series of the CR500 1987. For those of you who don't know, I picked up a scrap 1987 CR500. It was uh, just in pieces and I picked it up a few weeks ago and we are now in the process of I think this is the fifth video that's been done on this project. So I just want to take you through where we are. If you haven't seen the previous videos, go back and have a look and see me picking up the bike and uh, going through the processes to where we are now. But we're nearly ready to start building. We've got the head that's gone up to Liverpool to get reboard. I've just got all the parts back from paint. Uh, then the next thing is to put all the bearings in. All those bearings are now here. We have the frame ready to go. So stick around and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Like I said on the previous video, this stuff just keeps coming. Oh. They make wonderful titanium replacement parts, which you can't get anymore. Let's see if this fits. There we go. Rockle cable. I've bought so much stuff, I'm going to have to stop and just recalibrate what it is I've bought and what I'm checking. Today we're going to be looking at some of the lessons learned in uh, repairing a motorcycle like a CR500 and particularly the 1987. I can't speak for some of the other ones, but the 1987 being one year that was specific to its design with regard to the tank, silly things like the airbox cage which sits behind the sponge and compresses the sponge of the airbox filter on the back of the airbox. That you just cannot find. Uh, the tank, obviously, and any uh, OEM parts for these bikes are virtually impossible to find. In a sense, it's what makes them so valuable because uh, it increases the interest in the resale market of secondhand CR. So I'm delighted to be able to get this far with this bike. I would say one thing in particular is that if you are looking at buying a CR500, in hindsight, the best possible solution is to buy one that is already in one whole piece. It might be a wreck, but at least you'll have the components. The, the, the trick is to find out whether the key parts of the bike, specifically the tank, are original to the, the bike. Uh, in this particular case, I bought a bike that was a parts bike that I can only assume some of it was from a scrapyard of some kind. It only took a lot of uh, tenacity to drive through and fix like those uh, rear forks. Just about everything to do with those were wrong. So that's all good now. And with the silica blaster, this made a massive difference to the pace at which I was able to restore, particularly things like the screw heads uh, and any exposed aluminium parts. One of the uh, lessons learned in this particular case, which I'm going to transfer over to the Norton Commando, is sealing the aluminium again. It's one thing to polish aluminium uh, and leave it as, it as it is. It almost goes to a chrome-like finish, it's beautiful. But uh, aluminium oxidizes very easily and it goes a kind of a dull color. So it's very, very important to try and replicate the matte, satin matte finish that uh, is on these bikes is found and not to polish them, but to also seal them as I showed in the previous video. One of the mistakes that uh, a lot of us restorers make is to restore everything on a bike that maybe has never been assembled before. That can be a bike that's been in parts, in boxes. One of the things that I would say is very important to do is before we get painting is to fit them first to the frame. I had lots of issues with the, the Goodsey, for example, where I had painted the exhaust pipes and got everything ready and then found that the exhaust pipe had actually been damaged in an accident which had damaged the left side cooling fins, if you remember from that bike. But it also twisted the, the shape of the exhaust which meant that I had a lot of uh, post manipulation to do after I painted. So it's often a good thing to do is to fit parts to the bike first before you build it. Once I'm satisfied that I can go ahead and take all the bits off again, and then I get organized in the workshop and I'll go to the manual, particularly with bikes that I've never done before, like the CR500. I have to 
literally learn from scratch on how to start. So the best thing to do is to get organized. Decide how you're going to build this bike up from scratch. Go and look at videos, go and look at the manual, read the manual. It just, it possibly uh, over excitement gets you going too quickly and you end up uh, overdoing things or not doing things correctly. So get methodical, prepare every stage of the bike. In this particular case, this bike is almost ready to build. I've, there is some order in this, uh, but uh, I'm definitely not gonna be building the bike in this in this state so i've got to get all the screws correct i don't know what screws i've got i've got a whole bunch of boxes of scrapyard screws which i picked up for the from the cr uh, 250s and 500s so i'm going to go and assemble those onto the frame once i take all the stuff off this is just me getting excited and putting the bike together and having a look at things then i'm going to clean the threads out for each uh, hole find the right screw heads for each part and then put them in order make sure they're all clean make sure they're presentable the wheels i've got um firstly let me explain something to you the 87 i, I believe the 86 as well the 87 has these pale chrome rims now i've seen quite a few rebuilds where the gold is very very bright it's a i think it's for uh, later models anyway but they don't they don't work on the 87s in particular. Uh, it has to be this gold. And if you want to be authentic, you've got to get the DID rims. And they're 36 spoke wheels. Now those are very, very rare to find, uh, particularly because they're scratched up by now. They, you know, many, many years old. You would be tempted to anodize them. But from what I can find, I haven't seen uh, anodizing shops, certainly here in the UK, that are able to get that color right. They have specific anodized colors gold obviously silver and so on but they won't work so you either got to choose to take a full set of wheels and get them anodized in, a, in the wrong gold and then you've got at least some wheels or you try and find wheels now i've been lucky super 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 lucky so that's a solution that i've got now hopefully that should arrive in a week or so's time and the spokes have been uh, plate uh, cleaned so i've got to plate those and then we'll fit them and then true them and uh, that's another major part of the of the bike done as far as the plastics is concerned, uh, it's quite an important part of the restoration process to see what the average uh, finish will be. I have a very shiny OEM rear mud guard, I have a dull tank, and I have a scratched up scoop. So what I'm going to do is this, all these plastics with the, 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 the front muds and everything will be done in one go it's kind of why i did the tank first to get it to a point where it was similar to all the other parts so that when i do the final plastics i'm doing them all together so they all get the same finish i don't finish the tank and then go back and do other pits so i'm going to use the same process across all the plastics at the end so that i get a uniform finished the honda manual says that uh, the 250 kick is the same as the 500s so I want to try and solve this this play on here um, but I want to try and keep this because this is the original so I'm just looking for this part okay. nope I'm going to make a silica based epoxy which is going to build the teeth on, on this spline so that the wear on this spline will marry or the rebuild teeth on this side. So I'm going to see if that works. Can't lose anything by it. So I've now cured it. You can see a plastic film which protected the spine on the um, shaft side. So this should come off a few hours now. I just wanna see if I can get the spline off. That stuff is ultra hard. And I must say, that is so tight. It just feels marvelous. Whether it will hold or not, I don't know. Well, if you wanna give it a go, guys, you know, it's gonna save you a lot of money. Just going to grind off this surface here, 
get it cleaned up. And um, yeah, fingers crossed, this is uh, all we need. So this is how I um, put pressure on the spring to pull it down. So I just use uh, whatever I can that I have available to me. I'm gonna release that, take the tension of the spring, see the thread coming out and all we're going to do is just clean out these threads it always is an ugly job like magic these were sprayed with a matte finish um, I don't want it gloss because that's not how they were they were kind of a satin a satin matte oh, I'm very happy Looks like I'm going to have to rebore to the next size up. I sent the jug off to Liverpool to a place called Grampian Engineering. They supply the piston, so I think it should be a 90 millimeter piston. This is gonna be even bigger. It's important just to get it right now. So I'll get it back in a few days and then we'll put it all together. And uh, yeah, that should be almost done. Then we just assemble the bike. Right, first things first, before we even go any further, it's got to a point now where I've got a real mess in this workshop. I can barely see what I'm doing. I don't know where the bolts are. So now I'm going to, got all the rear fork parts there, body parts, rear drivetrain, brakes here, electrics there, and carburetor there, and cables there. I've got all engine stuff here. Got all the parts on the clutch. Here's all my spare bolts. Frame is now in position. The rear subframe is ready to go. And I have got wheels here. I've got two sets of radiators, so I'm gonna choose the best ones. And that's it. Let's get building. So I swapped correct bolts. Let's see if our repaired part stands up to scrutiny. I might still be able to repair it. It's just trying to squeeze it on the wrong way. I don't see any damage in them. Let's just see if I can get it together and there's any play. If there's any play, then I'll buy another one. Nice and smooth. Let's look at the radiators that I've got. I think it's fairly obvious that this pair is quite a lot more worn than this pair and see what bits and pieces I've got on them. But these clamp hose bits, to order them is just a pain and you know, every little bit costs extra. But today I'm going to be experimenting with uh, plating, nickel plating to be more precise. So I've set up a little temporary space and uh, I've got a voltage supply. So we'll see if we've got enough amps in that. We have the white wine vinegar, uh, we have acetone for cleaning. I bought two lots of nickel. We're going to be uh, taking you through the process of, or certainly myself, taking myself through the process along with you as my guests. And we have uh, sodium chloride, which is, um, is a form of salt, really. You put that in to induce uh, conductivity from the anode to the cathodes. I've never done this before, so it'll be my first time, and I realize already uh, I don't have any um, distilled water, so I need to go and get some of that.
I mean, even though this looks good, I'm still going to replace this O-ring. That's definitely got play in it. I left a little bit of the original on there. Perfect. Yeah, it's great. These are sometimes uh, so overlooked when you are uh, restoring just the bushings that go into either side of the shock that connect to the frame is what uh, is probably in terms of play uh, really really important and somewhat overlooked uh, nothing So it's a no-brainer. These certainly you want to replace. Lovely spring. Let's have a look how successful it came out. It is so clean.